Ah, it worked. Okay, my friends, again, welcome to this course in event logistics. Um, we will start with some practical issues, I think. Let's uh, have a look at our fronter to see what I have prepared for today. Maybe I should go to the to this one. Yeah. Uh, As always, we use Frontier for communication, so if there is any changes in lecturing times and so on, I will, of course, inform you by Frontier. So you should keep an eye on the Frontier system, and uh, then there will come up a message here, I think, saying that we have to postpone or whatever. So uh, please uh, keep an eye on the Frontier system when it comes to cha possible changes in the lecture times. As you already know, we plan uh, with four hours Monday, four hours Tuesday. I'm not sure whether we will use all these hours or every week, we will see, okay? Today there will be two hours, tomorrow maybe four, we will see how uh, much I'm able to lecture. Um, the documents are here, this is in Norwegian by the way, it should perhaps be in English, that should, um, we have to log on English, don't we? Uh, let, let's try and do it right here, okay? Yeah, we have to choose the language here, it seems. So let's choose Chinese, no, English, yes. And then... Uh, okay, and we have to... connected. Okay, this, this is no problem. So then we're back and let's have a look at the documents here. Uh, this is the normal way we organize it by these days. Uh, at least this guy who was in here previously, he wants us to kind of keep the same structure on every course. So uh, this will kind of be the way you, you should get used to. We have this information folder and a lecture notes folder, some exercises, solutions and added material and exam. This is the kind of structure I use all the time. So let's start with the information part here. <coughs> Uh, as you can see uh, on the top here, uh, there is lectures planned for Mondays and Tuesdays and we start 12.15 and possibly continue until 1600 and we have the same room each day. It's this room A285 as it says here. Some information about me, you can look at it if you like. Uh, there are two textbooks in the course. Uh, first, uh, we plan to start by this one. Production and Operations Analysis by Stephen Namias, and uh, it's a kind of standard textbook in uh, logistics or operations management or maybe even operations research, but the emphasis here is on the logistics part, so this should be a kind of neat textbook for the, the, the first half of the course. The second half of the course, we use this one, it's a very thin one, uh, written by me, and it kind of uh, drags the focus from classical logistics into the event side. So we kind of try to give you a, a kind of brush up on general logistics, logistics and then we kind of move into the event side. There is, as you probably already are aware of, some differences between general logistics and event logistics. So we, we might uh, see these differences as we move along. Uh, the curriculum, as it says here, will be defined through course progression, progression, meaning that I haven't kind of defined that yet, but uh, I have some basic ideas on what parts of these books we will talk about. In general, this book will be covered fully. Parts of this book will be covered. As it says here, in the old days it was called Class Fronter. Today I think it's called Fronter is used as the standard communication device between students and lecturers. So all information should be available there. Uh, and it's a, a bullet point on mandatory work here. It says here that exercises will be given during the course and they will be solved in class, more or less like we did in the introduction to event economics last year. And uh, these exercises are not mandatory. So you don't have to deliver anything to me. The only thing you have to do in these courses is to prepare for this written exam, which is four hours and should be given in week 44, according to the plan. So the idea then is that we finish this course up completely, 
before you travel to Switzerland. So you don't have to kind of have this exam in your head down there. Okay, that was the idea. It's not necessarily convenient for me, but uh, hopefully it's convenient for you. Okay. Do you have any questions related to this practical part? Everything is clear like glass or water or whatever is clear? Yeah. Okay, that's good. If you look back on... Uh, uh, maybe I should go back here. Is that possible? No. Here, okay. If you go up on level, there is um, other stuff here. We can have a look at some very brief lecture notes I prepared. prepared. Uh, they don't conta contain much, actually. Uh, of course, my hope is that uh, this taping structure would make it kind of not so important to have lecture notes formally written. So let's try and see what happens. Okay, I might make uh, bigger lecture notes as we move along if you feel that it's necessary. Uh, here I just have kind of a, a list of what I thought I'll talk about today. Uh, the basic course information have already been discussed, so we're going to finish that part. And then I thought I should say a few words about the mathematic necessities <coughs> for the course, more or, like, more or less like we did in the event economics course. Uh, we will kind of progress somewhat now, but an um, emphasis a bit different mathematical topics. So we will talk a little bit about what you know or don't know. Uh, you don't have any other courses in logistics, or did you have an introductory course? Well, then so you have that one. Okay, then you know a little bit about these topics, so um, that makes it easier. And then finally today I thought I should talk a little bit more about what logistics is, what it's not, and uh, how it kind of connects to other topics. There is a document there which uh, makes a certain written discussion about these topics, and uh, it's actually a planning document for this, this study program, so it, um, it, uh, it tries to kind of broaden the discussion on logistics and try to, to state why event logistics might be a course and how it could be structured. So it's, um, it gives you a certain insight in our planning process actually. So you can read it. It's available either by this link or in the, in the added material folder. So if we go back here now you can, uh, you can find it. Ah. in here. There is a lot of other material here, so we will use it as time goes by here. So this is basically the content uh, from two years ago. Okay. There is a math document here. I Presumably it's the one we... I'm getting. I never learned Windows 7 actually. So now I kind of stopped Yes, so then I have to go back to this one to find the. No, not that one. No, again, wrong. No, it should be right. So uh, let me now start by the second bullet point here and say a few, about, a few words about the mathematical necessities for this course. It's uh, available, as I said, in the added material folder. So again, we have to go back and let, just let me keep this one now. <coughs> okay, what do we need for the event management program? Uh, basically, this is... Uh, set up for the event logistics, but uh, these first parts are kind of standard. We need to, to be able to solve some equations, to isolate a certain variable on one side and get the rest on the other side. We probably need to know this formula for second degree equations, and I, this is kind of standard stuff. You already know this. This is nothing new. Uh, we need a certain amount of algebra. We need to be able to manipulate uh, certain expressions Preferably with the aim of simplifying. And you see an example here. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can see directly that uh, what's on the left hand side here 
equals what's on the right hand side. So let's just do this now to, to assure you that it's correct. It starts here with two times a parenthesis a plus b to the power of one third and then it's raised the whole thing to the power of six divided by a square root here of uh, four times a plus b squared. When we raise something to powers and when we raise it several times then the, the rule here is that we can multiply these numbers with each other straightforward. So on the top here we could write this as, and we can take this one inside here, a plus b to the power of a third times 6. So we just do the multiplication here and then we get 6 divided by 3, don't we? Which is 2. So we end up, if we keep the rest here, by transforming this, this then we get a plus b to the power of 2, so we end up here with 2 times a plus b squared. And of course we still have this one. Most students today uh, are kind of bad in algebra. That's my experience. I don't know the reason. We had to spend a lot of time in my own school days by kind of running through all this algebraic stuff. And it seems like modern students are missing these abilities. They, they are, are, are actually very important when it comes to dealing with mathematical stuff in general. When we handle formulas, very often we want to write them differently. Always kind of keep the equality sign and change it and change it that and it gets a form that we like. It's not always so easy beforehand to know what kind of form we like. So we, we have to kind of experiment. And see, okay, we end up with this expression looks nice. We can use that for that and that. So, so it's a, a kind of an art uh, using it. The rules are straightforward. Everybody can, can, can learn those. You know, when they change the signs and multiplicate and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's straightforward. But kind of applying it in a sense that makes it useful, it's kind of different. That's more like training and art. So you have to spend some time doing this when it comes to actually utilizing, utilizing it. We didn't finish, did we? Let's see here. There is 2a plus b squared. And down here there is a square root. Okay, So we can uh, see, look at 4, which of course has a square root, which is 2. And we can draw the square root of a plus b squared by just removing the 2. So we, we're back here with this one, isn't we? And then we can get rid of this one and this one and of course then we end with the result which is given in equation 2 here. Just an example on how we can kind of do manipulations algebraically. We need to, to some extent in this course, to, to be able to do this. Uh, the formula in 3 here is probably a formula you have seen, or isn't it? If you had this course in fundamental logistics, maybe this formula seems familiar to you. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, it's the EOQ formula. It actually is, yeah. So it, it plays a certain role in logistics, as you probably already know then. Uh, it's kind of derived by looking at total costs, Tc as a function of Q, and Q is the amount you order or actually produce, depending on what kind of setting you look at it in. Then the total costs uh, is uh, kind of decomposed here into components. Uh, there is an inventory cost, I of Q, plus an order cost, O of Q. And the inventory cost here is uh, a kind of unit cost, H, per inventory kept times average inventory, which can be shown to be Q halves. I don't know whether you actually saw that in that course. If, if not, we will see it here. Okay. And this is uh, the demand divided by how much you order. That tells you how many orders you make. And then there is a small s here, which is the unit order cost, the cost you pay per order, so to speak. And then you get this term here, which can be differentiated, equated to zero, 
to produce this one. Just take the first, first order derivative here and equate it, equate it to zero. You probably remember that very simple optimization. We will talk a little bit about that perhaps. <coughs> we need a lot of optimization in this course. That is kind of the, the main topic. So if you have a certain function, suppose it goes like this. Okay, here is f of x and here is x. If we construct the derivative of this function by a prime here, equate it to zero and solve this equation, then we should find two points on this graph, shouldn't we? We should find this point and this point. So equating the, the, the derivative to zero produces what we refer to as stationary points. These stationary points are candidates for the optimal solution. If you are interested in maximizing this function, you would end up with this point in the solution. Of course, it may not be the solution. Do you agree? If this one goes up here, and there is, let's say, a constraint here, actually this point would be the maximal point on this function. So we can't be certain that these stationary points guarantee the optimal value. We'll have to do some thinking <coughs> about this. Of course, if this function kind of flattens out like this, then of course this is the, the ma maximal point. This would be the minimal point. So it depends, again, on the sign of the second derivative. I don't know whether you have been into these matters, but uh, we will return to it later on. Uh, it turns out, in this case, that if we use this optimal value of the order quantity, Q star, and enter that into this function here, or this function if you like, and also enter it into this function, or this function, so which we, we can refer to as the optimal inventory cost and the optimal order cost, it turns out that these two values are the same. What's going on graphically here? <coughs> now, this total cost is compromised of two parts. We have the inventory cost, and if you look at the function of the inventory cost here, we have a constant here, and a constant here, and a variable here. So this part is a linear function in Q, isn't it? This is a constant, so it's kind of a constant times the x or the Q in this case. So this h times Q half is a function that goes something like this, isn't it? h times Q half. It's a linear function, it goes through the, the origo point because it doesn't have a constant in, in, in front. This other function, this one, has the Q under this line. This is what we refer to as a hyperbola, I think. It goes something like this, doesn't it? If Q gets very large, then it goes to zero. Okay, we get a very big number under this fraction sign. And it turns out here that if we kind of add these two functions together, we get a minimal point. So if we add this one with this one, we get a function which actually goes something like this, I think. And it has a minimal point exactly at the intersection between them. That is the meaning of this equation here. If we didn't know this, we could compute it, and that is done here, actually. Again, algebraic manipulation. <coughs> so what I do here then is that I enter the optimal value here first into the order cost function. The order cost is S times capital D over capital Q and instead of capital Q now I enter this expression here. Then I get what is here, don't I? S times D over this Q star which now is represented by this formula here. So then we have explained this one. Okay, and then I do something here to change how it behaves and how it looks. I just multiply on top and on bottom of the fraction here with the same number, this number, which is the same, by the way, as the one we have underneath. And that is, of course, not done without some knowledge. The idea, then, when you do this, is that you, if you have a square root of something multiplied with the square root of the same something, then, of course, you get the square root of som something to the power of 2, which kind of remains, so you, you get an S out of this operation. 
And that is the idea here, to get rid of the, the square root sign underneath here. So then, of course, you get rid of the square root sign, and you can take these two s d over h as a singular value under here, and you can write it in front like this. And then you can start getting rid of stuff, as you can see. The d's, they get, they get, they are, are taken out, and the s is getting out, and you get an h over 2 back. Can you see that? h over 2 times this one. Can you see that? This one is, yeah, let me write it. Okay, let me write it. Maybe that's easier. We started out with a q star equal to this square root 2 times small s times capital D divided by h. Okay, and then I want to enter this expression into this order for cost function, which looked like s times d over q. Okay, so I take this expression and substitute for the q here to get the optimal order cost. Then I get, by this operation, s times d over the square root of 2sd over h. Okay, this is what's happening here. Then I do an operation, then I multiply with the square root on top and on bottom. That is okay, isn't it? Because I can always get rid of them by doing this, and then I'm back to the original subject. So I don't change the, the content by doing this, and then I utilize the fact that these two square roots are vanishing, and I get s times d divided by d square root to s d over h, and of course these are cancelling, so this is remaining. I'll write it like this. Now I can do some reduction here, reduce here, reduce here, and I am 1 over 2 over h. Then I just turn it around, okay? So I end up with h halves times d square root. This expression is actually what we get when we enter the optimal order quantity into the inventory cost function. You can see that, can't you? h halves times q star. That's exactly what we have here. h halves times the optimal q. So what we have proved now, so to speak, is that in optimal in optimum, the order cost should equal the inventory cost. So if we didn't know how to take derivatives, we could use this instead and just draw the curves and look for the intersecting point, as I told you. So we could just use this method kind of way to find the solution by just finding this point here. Making an equation where we put order cost equal to, to um, inventory cost and solve for that. That would produce exactly the same solution as we get here. So kind of two different ways to approach the same answer. What's the point of that? Of course there's really not much of a point, but it opens up for different ways of doing things. Functions, derivatives, integrals. Uh, we already spent a lot of time talking about functions and derivatives in the economics course we had last year, and you probably have seen that in other courses as well, so I won't spend too much time on this. This is a kind of a simple rule for a certain set of functions, how to find derivatives. And in notation could change var in various sources here. Sometimes we write derivative with a prime, Sometimes we write it like this. This expression means exactly the same as. These are two, just two different ways of writing the same meaning. But uh, as you may or may not know, Isaac Newton kind of introduced this way of writing things, and it turns out that you can actually compute differentials. So if you have another dx here, you can kind of reduce it by that. So that is the reason for, for this way of writing things. You can kind of 
make computations on these derivatives as if they were variables, if you like. So it's a kind of a convenient way of doing it. But the point here is that if you have a function like this, c times x to the power n, we can find the derivative simply by multiplying by n and reducing this power with 1. So that, that is a formula you, we will use a lot. And it's, it's kind of the, the most normal function for, for finding derivatives. And if there is combinations of these, like uh, something like this, c1 times xn plus c2 times xm, we can of course use the same formula, but just adding together. So derivatives can be ma mani manipulated fairly easily by these structures. So the, the if this is f of x, then the derivative here would be n times c1 times x to the power of n minus 1 plus m times c2 times x to the power of m minus 1. We just apply the same for formula, even if you have combinations, linear combinations. <coughs> We have a, a general example here. So if we have a kind of general polynomial, as we call it, which is a kind of combination of more, much more than just two, a whole set of them, we can uh, simply take the derivatives of each of them and add together to get these kind of derivatives. We might need second or higher order differentials. Of course, finding a second order derivative is just repeating, making another derivative. So the second order derivative here would then be n minus 1 times n times c1 times x to the power of n minus 2 plus m minus 1 times m times c2 times x to the power of m minus 2. So we just take the derivative we already found and make another derivative. We can keep on like that as long as we like, basically. But for practical purposes, we are mostly interested in first-order derivatives and second-order derivatives. And then we have these rules we might, may need from time to time. Of course, this one we have already used, haven't we? If we want to take the derivative of a sum of two functions, we can take the derivative of each of the functions and add them together. We did that here, didn't we? Here is the u function and here is the v function. Took the derivative of each of them and added them together. So there is a certain linearity, if you like, in derivatives. If you want to find the derivative of, a, of multiplying two functions, there is a certain rule here. Then we can just take the derivative of the first one, multiply it by the second one, and do the same the other way around. So then we get this formula. If you want to find the derivative of a fraction, we use this formula. It looks like the sum formula, but the sign is changed from a plus to a minus, and we have to divide it by the square of the function under the fraction. Of course, it's straightforward to, to show this if you, if you know the <coughs> definition of derivatives. So something that you perhaps did not, we did not spend too much on, it's what is referred to as partial derivatives. In certain cases, we may have functions of more than one variable. Okay, that's kind of obvious. There, it may be that we, if we, for instance, uh, think about uh, the number of flats sold in Molde, there are more than one variable defining that, isn't it? One variable that could define it should be perhaps the interest. If there is very low interest, we would sell more flats. If it's very high, we would sell less. But there are other stuff as well, isn't it, that defines whether a flat is sold. For instance, the quality of the flat the price of the flat. So there's a lot of variables which influence how many flats we will sell. These could kind of be thinked mathematically as a function of more than one variable. So uh, flats could be a function, often write it like this, so x and y and actually a lot of variables here. And if we want to manipulate that mathematically, we can find, for instance, what is referred to here as partial derivatives. You see they are written like D, kind of a special sign here. It looks like this. D, F, it's a kind of a, it should be straight. So these denote that the function, which may be a variable, function of, let's say, two variables, F of x, y, these 
symbol tells us that we take the derivative of this function with respect to x, keeping y as a constant. This is really straightforward. If we have uh, uh, the function here, f o x y equals c times x plus b times y, which is a function of two variables, x, x and y, then the partial derivative of x with respect f with respect to x would then be the derivative of this part, because this is a constant and the derivative of a constant is zero. So this one would produce s, c. If we produce the partial derivative with respect to y, we would get b, wouldn't we? Because then this is a constant, produce nothing, then we get the derivative of that one. If f o x y equals x times y, take that example, then the derivative of x with respect to f with respect to x would be y, wouldn't it? Because y is a constant, x is the variable. Similarly, df dy would be x, okay? So this is how it runs, works. The reason why we're interested in these derivatives in more than one dimension is that the same rule applies here as it does in the single dimension. Recall we had this function here and we found these stationary points. If we move into a kind of space here where we have this kind of, how would it look, something like this perhaps, some kind of space like that, then by taking the derivative to the variables we could kind of find this point by doing let's say df dx equal df dy equals zero. So we, instead of solving one equation, you'd have to solve two equations to find these stationary points. So it works <coughs> the same way, uh, but we have to kind of move from single derivatives into partial derivatives. And we have to solve more than one equation to kind of find these stationary points. And there is also some theory related to the second derivative, you know, what, whether it's maximal or minimal points. We will not go into that today anyway. The reason why this is important in logistics is of course that in logistics we focus a lot on optimization. We want to do things efficiently, as efficiently as possible. Typically in logistics that would mean to minimize costs. That is the normal objective in all logistics uh, optimization. Unfortunately or fortunately, in practice, we will not use these methods here in logistics. We will use other methods because there is, in most situations, certain things that constrain us, that tells us that we, we cannot do this and that. I, in this space, it would mean typically that uh, we are not allowed to select these stationary points as our optimal solution. So if we again have this function here, it could be that we are, not, we are only allowed to be here. Let's say this is the only region we are allowed to search for a candidate. And perhaps here, okay? These are the only two regions we are allowed to pick or open. Of course, this one is not allowed and this one is not allowed. So we have to kind of look at this point and this point and this point and this point and compare them. If you want to find the biggest one, it's this one. The smallest one is perhaps this one. It's a little bit smaller than this one. This one is smaller than that one, okay? So we have to do use more kind of search-like techniques to, to actually solve these problems. We often refer to these as mathematical programming techniques in uh, the mathematical language, so to speak. And we will return to this in due time. So just, uh, this is just kind of keeping in touch with what we have learned. It says a little bit about optimization here, as you can say, basis, basic results. You can solve a single variable by solving the derivative equal to zero. It says here if S is F is well behaved. We can always construct cases where this doesn't work in a sense. If, it, if this function looks weird, if it goes something like this, for instance, so there's all these possible cases. So by well behaved, we basically mean that it kind of has strictly defined stationary points. It could be that those points are not strictly defined, but Luckily, it's a more like a seldom experience in, 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 in practice. And here you see this 
version of a multi-variable function. So if you have more than one variable, we can always construct a set of equations where we compute the partial derivative with respect to each of the variable. Equated to zero, we solve the system of equations we then end up with. It says in the end here that constrained optimization techniques, that's what I talked about here, isn't it? Here we have certain constraints which kind of take parts of our feasible space out. They're not allowed to be everywhere. And then we have to use different methods, SSL, but it also says here that we will look at it to some extent in the course. We will return mostly to that uh, in the second part, I think, but also a little bit in the first part. We need some knowledge of probability calculus. Uh, again, I don't remember what we did on that in our economics course. Did we do any probability calculus? Maybe not so much. Now, if I flip a coin once, there are two possibilities, either tail or this other one, which I don't remember. Okay. What's the probability of each of these outcomes? 50-50, okay, uh, given that it doesn't stand on the side. That, that's really, okay, so then you assume in a sense that uh, it's kind of not controllable what the outcome is, and then you assign a probability to it. Of course, then you can say, if I want to get a coin twice in a row, then I have to get it the first time with the probability half, and the second time with the probability a half. And if it's the similar probability, then you can deduce fairly easily that, uh, let's see, <coughs> that uh, uh, it's tail and coin. Let's use those two terms, okay, for the tail and head, I think they use in English, isn't it? T and H. So if you do two flips, you can get a tail and a tail in the first and the second a tail and a head, or a head and a tail, and a head and a head. That's the four options you have, isn't it? Each of those are equally probable, so it should be a 25% here, and the same for all others. Do you agree? And of course, you, you can see now that you can compute this probability by taking a half times a half to get it. A half times a half is 0 0.25, which is 25%. So this is kind of a part of probabilistic calculations. Okay, You can compute probabilities by multiplying them if you want to kind of find a, an event which is combined is 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 uh, keeping what we refer to as a un union in probability calculus so to get a tail in the first and a tail in the second you will get that in roughly a, a quarter of the cases the other cases will kind of be these ones as you probably you, you can continue like this but I, I don't think we need to look into this unless we reach it you see here the the basic laws of probability we actually use this one in this case. So you can find the probability of a union of two events by taking the probability of A given B times P of B. Or as the simple product, if there are independence. If there is no linkage between these two. If you think about the deck of cards, okay, it's 52 cards, isn't it? And if you want to find the probability of a flush in poker, say you want to do that, okay, you know what the flush is? You don't play poker? Nobody plays poker. Hmm. That's uh, either all clubs or all hearts or all diamonds or all spades, okay? Then you have five of the same flavor, so to speak. <coughs> uh, in order to get that, when you hand out five cards, of course the first one, let's, let's say we look at hearts then, okay? To find a flush in hearts, what's the probability? There is 13 hearts in the deck. There is a total of 52 cards in the deck, yes. So this is the probability that the first card we draw out is a heart, isn't it? Yes. Okay, in order to build our flush, we need to draw another card. But now we've already drawn out a heart, hasn't we? So how many hearts do we have left? There is 12, isn't it? Divided by 51. So this is the probability of getting two hearts when we draw from a card deck. Of course, it continues like this, doesn't it? To get five, we have to multiply by 11 over 50 
10 over 49, 9 over 48. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is the probability of getting handed out a flush in hearts. And you see the difference here. Here we multiplied by with two equal numbers. Here we multiplied by two different numbers. So here it's a dependent situation. This is an independent situation. The coin doesn't know that it turned out to be a tail in the first one. But the deck, of course, knows that because there is less cards <coughs> in it, so to speak. Even if the coin isn't really different from the deck, it's, this is nothing to do with intelligence. This is just kind of mechanics when it comes to probabilities. If you actually want to find the probability of flush, you just multiply by four. Either we can get it in hearts, or in clubs, or in diamonds, or in spades. Then we can utilize this sentence. This tells us that if you want to find the probability of a so-called union, or A or B, we can either get flush in spades, or in hearts, or in diamonds, or in clubs. Then we can compute that by adding each of these two probabilities and subtracting this one, the union probability. This one will always be zero. We can't get both flush in spades and in hearts, can we? That's not possible. So this one will always be zero, so then we can just add together these four probabilities, or which is the same as that, multiply by four. So this is the probability of getting a flush in poker without changing the cards. Of course, in poker you change cards, so it's a bit more tricky to, to find the real probability of ending up with a flush in a normal poker game. But this is the probability of getting it out in the first layout if you play with, with five cards. So that was a little bit about probability. We have kind of demonstrated what to use this for and what to use this for. And of course, if we add together the whole probabilistic space, then we must end with a certainty <coughs> or a probability of one. If I ask you what's the probability of either getting heads or tails, then that is 100%. You either get that one or the other. If we rule out this possibility on the coin standing on the thin side. That's uh, the meaning of this 13 here. So this kind of makes up probability calculus as a whole. You can extend it in many directions. We will return to it. We will discuss expected values, variance, discrete, continuous, densities, and so on. All this stuff is needed later in the course. Uh, I don't know what you know already. Some of you might have had certain courses discussing this. Some of you may have not. So we will kind of bring it in as it's necessary instead of kind of doing a kind of math tutorial first. This was just very briefly. So is there anything else here? No. That is basically what we need. Uh, the most important part is perhaps this discrete optimization part, which we haven't discussed really. Uh, I briefly told you that that's something about ruling out certain parts of the area. And that is basically what it's about. We have to do things slightly differently. OK, do we have any questions? Overwhelming? Fast? Uh, most of this is stuff you know already. There are certain parts here which kind of extends it. But we will, we will see as we move along, I think, that uh, this is not uh, too tough. It kind of comes by itself as we move around, along. OK. OK. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. OK. Uh, we talked about the basic course information. We talked about math necessities. I think uh, actually a break is very well suited now. So let's uh, meet again in 15 minutes. OK?